So welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this reprise session from the ACRL 2023 conference that just wrapped in Pittsburgh. Um, this is No Thoughts, Just Vibes, Interrogating Algorithms Through Art and Information Literacy. And just, I may be biased, but this was my favorite session of the conference. And I'm so pleased that these folks were willing to let us hear from them again today. So, uh, and I'm glad all of you can join us for that. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, just this session is being recorded and we will share that link with everyone afterwards yeah. um also uh if you have any questions um please hold them till the end but feel free to put them in the chat at any time and we will be monitoring that and we will have some time for q a at the end my lovely colleague sarah carter is here um, she is the vice chair of the art section and she will be helping us moderate the chat um and i should have said hello everyone my name is carla make crookendale and i am the um arts research librarian here at virginia commonwealth university in Richmond, Virginia, but I'm also the chair of the art section this year, so that is why I am here talking to you today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I just want to introduce the folks who will be sharing with you today. We have Mackenzie Salisbury, who is the information literacy librarian at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and she also is a past chair of the art section, so welcome Mackenzie. We have Maggie Murphy, who is the art and design librarian at UNC Greensboro. Um, we have Mimosa Shah, who is the associate curator for the Schlesinger Library at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. And last but not least, um, my colleague Stephanie Grimm, who is the art and art history librarian at George Mason University. So welcome all, and I will turn it over to Mimosa to get us started. Hi, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for coming to the reprise of No Thoughts, Just Vibes, Interrogating Algorithms Through Art and Information Literacy. As um, Carla May so generously introduced us, I won't go through too much introduction except to say my three fellow panelists um, generated a lot of enthusiasm for this, and I'm very grateful that they asked me to join them. Um, their names are Maggie, Stephanie, and Mackenzie. So today we'll be discussing the ways that arts-based research and strategies for instruction in relations to arts-based inquiry coincide, collide, and connect to literacies regarding algorithms. I'm just gonna advance our slide here. Brief introduction, and no, that's not how I really look, but that's you know kind of the vibe we're going for here right now. Um, I honestly don't like those Buenas Paltrow glasses, but you know, we take what we can get. So that aside, um, we are inspired. We are inspired by the work of Safia Noble in her 2018 book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. Noble writes about how mathematical formulations undergird decisions that are frequently automated. But these formulations are designed by humans. And rather than being benign, or objective, algorithms are processes and rules that have distinct choices made, and those choices are used to solve the problems. And as you see on this slide, we have a brief definition of algorithms, and we just wanted to set the stage for what we are using as our working definition. So according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, algorithms are defined as a procedure for solving a mathematical problem in a finite number of steps, often with repetitions of an operation. Other uses, a search algorithm that determines what type of data are retrieved. Encryption algorithm, or a set of rules for encoding information. As far as artificial intelligence is concerned, we think of them as machines that perform tasks requiring human intelligence, especially when machines learn from data how to do those tasks. They're systems for making predictions, recommendations, decisions influencing real or virtual environments. Ultimately, AI, as referred to by um, Cox and Mojumdar, which is part of a series of resources that we will be sharing with you slowly, um, but from a paper authored by them, AI is an idea. It's one that's evolving and also suffused with cultural meaning and significance 
that even its most professional applications can't be ignored. So the art historian Sonia Drimmer has written about the ways AI has hijacked her field, such as the lost lover of Modigliani or the hidden Picasso nude. It's like this whodunit that we have to use to frame our research. And this plenitude that we're seeking, where has it surfaced elsewhere? In the case of Picasso, companies like Oxio Palace use technologies to read this original work of art, break it down into minuscule pieces, and then extrapolate them to create another familiar but not real work that effectively creates content in the same style. Drimmer wisely articulates that this panic around using technologies to reinscribe and underwrite humanity's inquiry, it's a claim to legitimacy amidst the rapidly shifting landscape that devalues a lot of humanities related and research. A quote from her, at their core, um, and this is a quote not from Sonia Drimmer, but rather uh, a quote from another piece we read on um, what is the work of arts related research and art historians. They study the ways in which art can offer insights into how people once saw the world. They explore how works of art shaped the worlds in which they were made and would go on to influence future generations. So now it's 2023. The latest version of ChatGPT haunts instructors and TAs, wondering what their students' assignments might look like, how terrible they might be. Amidst the panic, our library workers like us, you and me, recognizing, remembering, we've seen this before. New technologies, another vibe, a better promise. As guides, as people, we care a lot about information literacy. And we wonder what can we do to effectively address and critique the forms of knowing while promoting playfulness and above all speculation about these shiny new tools. So I'm gonna let Stephanie take over. Thank you so much, Miyamasa. Uh, so good morning, everyone. For my section of this panel, I'm going to be looking a little more broadly at artificial intelligence uh, versus specific algorithmic processes and thinking about how artists work in conversation with machines. I'm also going to preface this by noting my really, really strong, uh, the really strong limits of my technical knowledge in this field. Um, but uh, I took this panel working with this group um, as an opportunity to learn about this and to think about how this is going to apply to the students that I'm working with, conversations with faculty and conversations across campus. Um, so this was really as much about learning from folks like Maggie and Mimosa and uh, Mackenzie, um, and then also looking at some of the artists that I'll talk about later. So for a little context, George Mason University is a public research one institution that has a very large and growing school of art. We don't have individual specialization degrees. Um, we offer BFAs and BAs and certificates, but we do have a large number of students coming in with interests in comics and illustration, graphic design, photography, computer and game design, in addition to other quote unquote traditional areas of fine art practice. And so in these courses, students are often working with digital technologies and new media. And if your situation is like mine, you've already had many reaching out with questions and maybe projects or papers they're having to write, um, looking at issues of AI and copyright with regards to artists. Next slide. Thank you. So I wanted to think about how we can help students to be ready to engage with this topic rather than reacting to each new iteration of technology that comes out um, because this is so rapidly changing. There's no settled case law really on um, any of the questions around copyright and AI, for example. There are all the questions of ethics coming through. Um, so instead I wanted to think about the ideas of the artists and the questions that could come into the classroom that would help prepare students to engage with these, these conversations, whether or not they choose to use AI technologies or engage with them in their own work. Um, I'll also note that the activity I'm sharing later is not stress tested. This is one I haven't actually been able to teach yet, but have designed, as Mimosa was talking about, as a speculative approach, thinking about what I might want to do and talk with students about, um, but also responding to things I have heard coming from faculty members. Next slide. So I wanted to find ways to bring questions to students to get them thinking about what it means to make art. 
their ways of seeing, their decisions and their habits, all the biases and perspectives that they bring into the process. How do you reference other artists? When you say you are, quote, inspired by someone's art, what does that mean? We can ask students to apply those same questions to machine learning. How do you think machines learn to see or decide where to draw inspiration? If a student decides to work with generative AI technology like Dolly 2 or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, or start training their own AI systems, which artists have done for, for many years now, um, is that a work of collaboration? What does it mean to make work with a machine that sees differently than us? Next slide. So part of this is asking students to reflect on their own understanding of how they learn, how they classify information, to think about how these technologies see and learn and classify information. Scientists and programmers often talk about AI with language that likens machine vision and machine learning to human vision or learning. They, quote, see images in ways that are similar to humans or, quote, emulate human thought. But is this really true? Um, I use this as a chance also to play with some of these technologies. So the prompt on screen is uh, from Dolly 2, but I asked it to show me a camera scared of its own reflection and it gave a camera with no lens. So make of that what you will. Um, next slide. So in an extended and wide ranging essay on machine vision, AI, surveillance, curator and theorist Nora Khan challenges a lot of these analogies that liken machine vision to human vision. Um, she notes them as fallacious and how this kind of language obscures what's really happening with machine learning. Khan describes it as a, quote, mask of neutrality in neural networks. Quote, the revelation of ideology and our precious tools is usually presented as a shock, like that friend who says they don't see color or treat everyone the same. This probably sounds familiar to other librarians. Um, but I really love this quote from Khan. Uh, this essay was published to Brooklyn Rail in its uh, entirety. It's um, nearly book length and it's also been published as a book, um, but you can read it online. I'll drop a link in the chat. But Khan notes how this idea of people simply dreaming up images or imagining images and the same application to machine vision um, is, is false in both regards, that people don't just dream up images, but that, quote, we actively generate images through our biases and our memories and histories, our styles of narrative and our traumas. Next slide. So for example, we could look to artists like Nigerian American artist, Mimi Enohua, who uploaded images of herself and her family to Google image reverse search and looked at how the machine classified those images. Um, in this case, it simply tagged her as girl in many instances and how it started to recognize affinities and identified similar images. Um, so this is from us aggregated. The project is no longer online in its entirety. You can find it from the Internet Archive, um, but there's a lot of documentation on Anohua's website as well. Next slide. Another example we could look to is designer and developer Tom White, who trained neural networks using sets of everyday kinds of objects like rotary fans, rulers, sewing machines. And he designed a drawing system for the machine to create a new consolidated image based on what it had learned of those. Um, the results read as visually abstract to human viewers. But when these images are fed back into machine vision tools like Google Image Reverse Search, it recognizes those as the original objects. So for example, the image on the left, this is not a forklift. Um, that is a consolidated and abstracted uh, machine drawing of how many thousands of images of forklifts. Um, this is a super cool project. There was just an article published in Leonardo uh, earlier this month about this project, but uh, White also has some info on his own website about it. And he made Rezo prints of all these images. <laughs> Next slide. So returning to this conversation or this question of how can we prepare students to talk about or talk to AI? We can put this into the language of the ACRL framework um, of scholarship as conversation, but that starts to throw things for a loop. What does it mean in this qu question when one of the conversants is a machine? Artists like Anahua and White show us some of that potential. Through their projects, they reveal how these systems actually operate um, more than what we might get by reading lines of code ourselves. Uh, or just reading about reactions and um, people sort of responding to what they're seeing come out of the machines. So how can we bring some of that into the classroom? 
Next slide. So this is a rough plan, um, but in this example, I want students to bring one of their own existing artworks to a class, something they've made previously, and then ask them to reflect on that process of creation. What artists, ideas, or questions were they engaging with? What images do they have in mind? Or what did they directly reference? Um, illustration students often have their own, or in photography students have their own morgue files of images that they're referring to. Um, if you're a collage artist, it's sometimes really easy to point exactly to where you're getting your references, but having them uh, reflect back on that process. Then I want them to think about how they would explain those influences to a machine and have them write a prompt that they could use to work with generative AI like Dolly or Midjourney to make something new. After doing that, ask the students to compare the new work to their own and see if they can start to understand or think about why the AI made certain decisions, um, what maybe their language, how their, how their choice of language affected the, the prompt and, and what was generated. And then finally, uh, sort of a fun piece that extends this, take the new machine generated image and feed it into a reverse image search tool. So like Google Lens or reverse image search and see what the machine understands about something coming from another machine. Next slide. So in the absence of having a class to work with, I decided to take one of my own um, works uh, as an experiment here. Um, this is from a project where I was asked by a friend to do a promotional set of illustrations for a book that was coming out. Um, and so this postcard uses some imagery from the actual book cover, uh, but the prompt was, can you draw my cat, Miette, jumping through the portal? Um, so I took that prompt and I expanded it a little bit just based on things that I visually saw that I knew the, the author was interested in um, and took the text ragdoll cat jumping through a surreal hoop with pink and blue clouds. Um, I also tried switching out different words like vaporwave or watercolor um, and took these to a couple different tools. Next slide. So this is the first result from Dolly 2. Uh, they're weird. <laughs> um, I actually kind of love them. I, I was shockingly surprised. <laughs> I saw Maggie's quote. I do still love these. I actually really love this first one. It reminds me of that old um, Quiznos commercial, We Like the Subs. So there's something just very strange about that puppet cat. Uh, clearly, though, there, there's some work that, that could be done here. Um, Next slide. But then Maggie uh, <laughs> was really interested in like how weird these looked. And so took my prompt to a different generative AI, took it to Midjourney and ran the same thing, but startlingly, startlingly different results. So at first glance, these are really intriguing. They have much more of a unified look than the previous one. They seem to have more of that kind of optical realism. Um, Although on closer inspection, certain details emerge, like a third paw with this cat or sort of a, a nub back leg on this one. There's other oddities in here uh, that kind of work for what this whole project was about. Um, and also made me really question like my own processes as an illustrator and my own tendency to, to sort of make really direct responses. Next slide. These are just some more examples. Um, uh, really shocking, <laughs> again, uh, not far off from sort of what I was doing with, with the original work. Next slide. So I took that first uh, Dolly 2 image and brought it back into Google image search. Um, this first result is from Google Lens. Uh, the main thing it seemed to recognize here was this hang in there baby series of posters and uh, if you'll actually notice too, many of the results are trying to sell me prints, which is interesting. Um, there's a lot of Society6 results here. Uh, so it seems to be clearly recognizing the image of like the cat suspended in midair. Next slide. And then if I went from Google Lens to the, the classic uh, reverse image search, here it seemed to be picking up more of the colorways um, and the shapes that were happening rather than recognizing it like as a cat, which is interesting. Uh, next slide. Then I took one of the mid-journey images and did the same thing. Um, the results on this first pass look much more visually similar 
Uh, and you may even notice something. If we can click one more time. It connected <laughs> the mid journey image back to my result or to, to my original piece from Twitter. Uh, and I will note too, the prompts did not have the cat's name in it. They didn't mention the author. It was just ragdoll cat jumping through a hoop. Um, so still it was somehow able to recognize and make that visual connection back to this work. Next slide. So like I said, for me, this was this was a really revelatory moment thinking about my own like ways of um, of artistic processes and development that I maybe tend to make things really directly uh, in response to something, whereas lots of illustrators are interested in uh, finding different or more abstracted ways of working with a concept. So that's something I want to kind of take back to my own uh, thinking of these biases or habits that I bring to creative processes and how those were amplified or challenged by machine learning tools. So these are questions we can start to ask students to reflect back on. So what becomes very obvious when you're making when you're making this work and when you're working with these tools. But also, what does it mean to make work in conversation with AI? Are you seeding control or are you working with a new tool? Is AI a collaborator or is it an interloper? And in these conversations, who is doing the most talking? Thank you. Hey. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, thank you. Um, I'm Maggie Murphy. Uh, I uh, am the art librarian at UNC Greensboro uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we are a public R2, uh, and our School of Art is um, one of the fastest growing uh, units on campus. Um, it's the only one that did not have an enrollment decline uh, this past year. Um, and uh, I work really closely um, with both the uh, art history um, programs and the studio art uh, and um, new media and design programs. Uh, and so the context um, that I'm working in uh, today is um, thinking about uh, the sort of information seeking um, and research practices, uh, uh, behaviors, and so on um, of my new media and design students. Uh, next slide, Mimosa. Um, so, uh, I think a lot about um, creative inspiration and the context in which uh, we find it um, in uh, the present day and age. Um, and so uh, non-purposive, um, meaning you know, not driven by a specific objective, um, browsing in gallery, library, um, archives, and museum collections uh, has long been, as long as there have been, you know, kind of curated collections of media um, and artists, uh, a, a way that artists um, uh, can encounter um, unexpected sources of inspiration serendipitously. Um, and so these collections are curated by people with a range of biases. And um, uh, Mackenzie is going to talk more about that sort of process of organization. Um, in her section in just a little bit. But the thing about these collections is that they do not dynamically rearrange themselves in response to the user. Um, so the person who is browsing through them sees them um, either in uh, the order that they encounter them um, or in like a physical collection, you know, the order in which they kind of navigate the space. Um, so what you see while you're browsing um, is really based on what you choose to pick up next. So, um, you know, this is a process of human agency uh, if we are talking about browsing in um, glam collections. Next slide. Um, on social media platforms, especially visually driven social media platforms, um, students in all disciplines uh, use these, um, you know, in their uh, non-academic contexts as well as academic contexts. Um, and whether or not they um, are uh, students studying um, creative disciplines in their academic context, um, uh, pretty much all Instagram users um, uh, searching for inspiration related to their hobbies, um, travel, uh, interior decoration, all kinds of things, um, is cited as a top motivation for engaging with Instagram um, and similar platforms like Pinterest. 
Um, and so although Instagram content is uploaded by a way more diverse range of users than what ends up in curated glam collections, um, the explore feed um, uh, is curated by deep learning recommendation algorithms that learn from context, content, and user behavior. Um, so this feed is similar to the TikTok for you feed um, and uh, other sort of spotlight feeds that show the user. Um, here is what the algorithm thinks you would like based on what you have interacted with and looked at previously. Um, and so this process, instead of based on human in, uh, agency, is more based on techno determinism. Um, so uh, the technology is, is the one determining what we see next. Next slide, sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, so thinking about how I would contextualize this for students, um, I would want to have a conversation with them about how these recommendation uh, systems, these suggestion algorithms, these discovery feeds are really compelling because they're kind of a mirror. They show us content that we haven't seen before um, that fits in with whatever we have kind of established as our vibe or aesthetic. Um, but if this becomes our sole or even dominant source of inspiration as artists or creators, how are we going to encounter the unexpected? How will we have that serendipitous experience? Um, so ultimately to sort of um, uh, fight against this new paradigm, I want students to be able to critically examine um, suggestion algorithms or recommendation uh, systems from a variety of angles. And these include, next slide, Um, I want them to be able to develop skills and dispositions for non-algorithmic browsing, analog browsing of visual material um, to complement whatever processes of digital inspiration seeking um, they like to engage in. Um, I also want them to think about those effective dimensions of algorithms, um, why uh, we spend so much time scrolling a feed on social media um, and uh, how we sort of put ourselves into a box um, or have a personal relationship, um, we get attached to whatever um, we think of as a style or aesthetic that defines our work. Next slide. Um, and so here um, I have a screenshot from a project um, like uh, something Stephanie mentioned earlier, this project doesn't seem to actually be operational anymore and is mostly memorialized in this conference paper, um, but it was a project called art I don't like. Um, and there were three um, researchers from UCLA that built this system uh, that was meant to be an artistic intervention that emphasized the introduction of disparate content in response to the proliferation of suggestion algorithms or recommend, uh, recommender systems. The word or is missing there. Um, and so uh, here the screenshot shows us um, a grid of images um, that uh, would be sort of suggested to the user um, and you would select, you know, certain images and based on what you would select, it would show you something different. It would show you something that does not match that vibe or aesthetic. Um, so a different way that you would uh, encounter content and anti-recommendation. Next slide. Um, Similarly, Ben Grosser built um, a plugin for TikTok um, described as an automated confusion system uh, called Not For You. It's a browser extension that's designed to mislead TikTok's recommendation algorithm, um, making it possible for you, the TikTok user, to see how TikTok feels, again, that effective part, when you're no longer seeing content that is for you. Um, and so uh, here the image shows us, um, it's an animated GIF of toggling onto uh, this um, browser extension. Uh, yes, we'd like to confuse TikTok and escape that algorithm. Um, next slide. So continuing the sort of things that I want students to be able to think about and do and feel, um, I want them to be able to interrogate practical, creative, ethical, and philosophical relationships between artists and algorithms more broadly. And these include algorithms, uh, include relationships that use algorithms to create art um, and those that make art to disrupt algorithms, um, as well as the complicated uh, relationships that uh, artists have with um, posting their art to social media and how the algorithm controls what the audience sees. And we see a lot of responses to that um, by artists, um, including those who uh, feel compelled to change the art that they make um, so that they get more 
um, exposure on social media. Um, they're constantly reflecting on what does the algorithm want, uh, especially because the algorithms are changing all the time to emphasize things like more um, uh, multi, I'm sorry, uh, video content, more video content, um, process uh, sort of reels, uh, all kinds of things um, that they may feel like they're getting exposure uh, and they have an audience and then suddenly there's some tweak to the algorithm and they lose it. And then finally, I want them to think about the technological dimensions of deep learning and computer vision algorithms um, and uh, sort of create responses to these that manually iterate on that technique um, of thinking about what are the visual or formal components of this image that kind of uh, fit into that Viber aesthetic, similar to um, what Stephanie was reflecting on, looking at um, what Google Lens and Google Reverse Image Search responded to in the image that she uploaded. Next slide. Um, so here I just have a screenshot from a blog post. Uh, the artist is uh, Sari Shrake, I think is how we say your name. Um, and so this was a post from her blog on her uh, website, Not Sorry Art, um, called Artists and the Algorithm. And in here, she is just reflecting again on that resistance that she has um, to creating work that will reach a broader audience as Instagram continues to tweak its algorithm uh, and sees less and less engagement with content on the platform. And the image shows um, an, an analog painting, she's a painter, um, of an image captcha that says select all images with palm trees uh, on a sort of drop cloth with lots of um, uh, paint brush strokes. Next slide. Um, and then uh, Suzanne Kite is an Oglala Lakota performance artist um, who contributed uh, to a paper um, called Making Kin with the Machines. Um, and in this paper, she reflects um, on uh, how Lakota ontologies um, and epistemologies uh, already reflect um, non-human relationships. I'm gonna read a quote from this just really quick um, to think about how artists and humans um, can think about uh, algorithms and machine learning technologies and AI um, as uh, non-human kin that we are in relation with. Um, so how can humanity create relations with AI without an ontology that defines who can be our relations, meaning, you know, our relatives? Um, humans are surrounded by objects that are not understood to be intelligent or even alive and seen as unworthy of relationships. In order to create relations with any non-human entity, not just entities which are human-like, the first steps are to acknowledge, understand, and know that non-humans are beings in the first place. Lakota ontologies already include forms of being which are outside humanity. Lakota cosmologies provide the context to generate an ethics relating humans to the world and everything in it. These ways of knowing are essential tools for humanity to create relations with the non-human, and they are deeply contextual. As such, communication through and between objects requires a contextualist ethics which acknowledges the ontolo ontological status of all beings. So again, these are just examples of different ways that artists um, are reflecting on and thinking about relationships to the algorithm. Next slide. Um, so uh, as um, an example um, of a technology that students might want to think about in terms of the um, technical uh, aspects of how it works, um, there is a tool, and I can put this URL in the chat um, because it is very simple. It may not, uh, Zoom may not even recognize it as a URL. No, it does, okay. And it's called Same Energy. Um, and so it does use computer vision. Um, and when you get to the home page, you will see a grid of kind of different kinds of images, illustrations, um, paintings, photographs, et cetera, uh, landscapes, portraits, patterns. And you can start interacting this um, by searching uh, for specific keywords, um, uploading an image as a starting point and doing sort of that reverse search, or just interacting with the grid that we see. You can also browse through their different categories. Um, and so uh, I took this screenshot a couple of weeks ago, and this was kind of just what I saw when I um, went on the site. And if I were to click um, on the uh, portrait in the far right, um, of the black woman with uh, space buns, which I love, I love space buns, um, uh, then we would see something like the next slide. Um, 
it's going to show us uh, similar images, images that have the same energy, the same vibe, the same aesthetic. Um, so we're seeing, yes, a lot of space funds, um, but also uh, a whole range of different kinds of digital illustrations. Um, and, and there may be some um, uh, sort of physical media in there as well, but I think a lot of this is digital. Um, and so we're seeing um, things that, you know, uh, range from more representational to sort of more cute um, and cartoonish, um, uh, some similar color palettes, um, but again, sort of all with the same vibe showing us the same kind of content. Um, and if I were to click on um, the image uh, of the person with the uh, red sunglasses and hoop earrings um, towards the center, uh, we would see um, the grid respond again. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, so here we're seeing things with even more vibrant uh, colors. Um, we're seeing a lot of the same um, kinds of uh, media. Um, so a lot of like markers and colored pencils, airbrush effects, and so on. You'll also notice that on the top left, there has been a search box below the image. Um, and if I were to add a new term there, um, such as next slide, glass, um, now I'm seeing images of glass, and I don't actually know if all of these objects exist or if some of them are AI generated images because there are a lot of sort of speculative images um, of glass and ceramics and things made by uh, generative AI systems like Dolly 2 um, and Midjourney. But uh, here we're seeing glass that has the same vibe of, as that image, right? The sort of dynamic colors, um, you the translucence of the glasses is sort of reflected um, in the glass. We're seeing um, a stained glass portrait uh, of um, uh, a person who uh, is wearing something that looks like blue waves, sort of like the, the wave pattern under the portrait here. Um, and so you can see how this sort of just responds to and and builds on that idea of the aesthetic or vibe um, from an image that involves color, but also um, other formal elements as well as content or subject. Okay, next slide. Um, so I'll try to wrap this up pretty quickly, um, but in terms of a speculative lesson plan, um, which I have not had a chance to do, but I think that I will um, during our uh, summer um, camp uh, that UNCG does, with um, incoming or pre-college students. It's an art camp. Um, and so I think a week-long camp would be a perfect place um, to do this sort of activity. Um, so if we started out uh, with a group of students, I'd want them to play around with same energy and discuss how they think that technology works. And then I'd want them to think about how is that technology the same to uh, the same as or different from similar to or different from the algorithm uh, that makes recommendations and populates their social media explore for you discovery feeds. Um, then I'd want them to look at their own social media and if a student is like I do not use social media, I would come up with some other alternative, um, but I haven't encountered that uh, just yet in my own teaching. Um, so they would pick three images from their own social media feed that they think um, share or exemplify a vibe of something that they like. Um, I want them to reflect on why do they think these images were suggested or recommended to them? Um, and how would they describe that aesthetic? What name would they give that vibe? Then I'd want them to uh, spend time browsing and searching and developing parameters for finding images that fit into that vibe or aesthetic, but that come from a print media um, or digital glam collection. Uh, and then I'd want them to think about why were these images chosen and what strategies did they use to find them and how is that different than just um, browsing or scrolling through a feed. And then finally, I'd want them to create a new visual work that remixes, references, or builds upon um, that sort of combined image feed. The, you know, so the literal images from their explore or discovery feed, plus the images that they added into it. So a conceptual feed of images. Um, and uh, get them to think about what they learned from that process uh, with regard to their creative practice. Um, what were the differences between um, what they found, the strategies they used, uh, and how they um, kind of interpreted or took inspiration from that in their own work. Uh, next slide. Um, and so uh, our ACRL panel, um, you know, ACRL is not necessarily for an audience of um, art or arts librarians. 
And so I was thinking about um, how people might adapt this sort of activity for different contexts. Um, because browsing is a form of discovery in algorithmic environments as a fashion facet of information behavior that can be explored outside of creative fields. Um, so students in all disciplines might be able to explore questions like, how does the impact of algorithms different differ between tools for searching and browsing? Um, what's the interplay between algorithms and visual culture in your discipline? Because every discipline engages with uh, or has its own visual culture. Um, and thinking about the role of generative AI on society, including our discovery feeds. Um, like I said, I'm actually seeing in my own Instagram explore feed um, more and more images that are um, images created by AI uh, that are being uploaded by human users, um, or maybe bots, I don't know. Um, so people are uh, feeding back gener generated images into those feeds. Um, and so am I going to be more and more influenced by images that show um, sort of speculate speculative possibilities um, that don't quite exist just yet? Um, I think that's my last slide. It was. Okay. Take it away, Mackenzie. All right, well, thanks everyone. And uh, thanks to my uh, presenters as well. So my section is kind of building on a lot of the things that um, both uh, Maggie and Stephanie have talked about. Um, and I'm gonna try to keep it short so that we leave time for questions at the end if there are any. Um, but my name's Mackenzie Salisbury. I uh, work at SEAC and um, the session that I'm gonna be talking about is also speculative, although I am gonna do it on Monday, I'm very excited, um, with uh, a faculty member here, which I'll talk about. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about today is uh, this idea of sorting and browsing, as Maggie mentioned earlier. Um, and so I'm gonna start with where I kind of started getting inspired um, in terms of like reading. So if we wanna to go to the next slide, please. Um, so for those of you that are interested in learning more, I read this book, Robot Proof, um, Higher Education in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And uh, this is actually a couple of years old. I think it's from 2017. Um, but I think it's a really good primer for not just what we do, but like how it's going to affect or ideas on how AI might affect um, the space of higher education. And there's this one quote that I really enjoyed um, because I think that there's a lot of anxiety around AI, not just with image generation and in art, but just like holistically. Um, and so I love this quote um, and the, the highlighted bit, which says uh, essentially that AI will lack the very human lens from which we view life, learning to interpret context, to assess, act, and make sound decisions. I think that to me is like the thing we need to hold on to. Um, I think there's a lot of similarity with things like Wikipedia when we were, you know, when that was kind of hot on the scene, how higher ed um, responded to that. And I think most of us have come around to like embracing it and really utilizing it. And I think that AI in terms of things like algorithms and chat GPT, um, I think there's an opportunity there in terms of how we teach and think about learning. Um, even uh, both Maggie and Stephanie talked about you know, this idea of like visual literacy and how we can utilize these kind of AI generation tools to kind of reverse engineer some of the learning. Um, and I think that that's kind of what I am hoping to do as well um, with my lesson plan. Uh, next slide, please. So I am, uh, I have to give full collaboration credit to uh, an amazing faculty member here at SAAC. Um, Nick Breeze is an artist. He's, he mainly does glitch in web art. Um, but he's also an amazing human. Uh, he runs a uh, nonprofit digital literacy and culture um, organization here in Chicago called Netizen. He and I have collaborated on many uh, events, specifically back in 2021. We did one about, um, I think we, we called it Bias Out of the Box, which was essentially a two-day event where we had um, the uh, director from the uh, movie Coded Bias. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend. Um, anyways, he's just like a great collaborator always. And um, when we were at ACRL, I gave this anecdote. Um, when he first started at SAAC, maybe like four years ago, five years ago, he emailed me and he said, um, Mackenzie, I'm new here and I'm teaching this class. And I'm wondering, can I 
uh, send you my syllabus and come by and talk to you because I want to make sure I have enough information literacy embedded in my course. So like automatically like a rock star out, right out the gate. Um, so I'm very, very lucky to collaborate with him. Um, and so this is the person that I work most closely with around things like algorithms. Um, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so because, you know, hashtag art school, we have a lot of really interesting classes, including um, this class. So we have um, two kind of freshman uh, classes that every student has to take called Research Studio. The first class is really just like, okay, you got into art school, like how to be an artist, how to live in Chicago. It's very like first year experience. That's the first semester. And then the second semester is the same class, but it usually has more of a um, theme attached to it. Um, and Nick teaches this class as well as a couple of others and his kind of secondary theme. Uh, this one is called Wi-Fi Wizardry. Um, this is his course description, um, which immediately when I read it, I was like, oh, this is gonna be like a great collaboration to have. Um, I think in, in particular, he really likes leveraging research strategies of hackers, critical engineers, data journalists, and digital rights activists, including artists. Um, and he really wants, this class is really about investigating algorithms and how they mediate our lives. Um, so immediately this was like an easy uh, person to connect with, especially around things like this. And I've been wanting to do a session that was really um, in conversation with these things more directly and thinking about how we could apply that or use the library to like show some of these things more directly. Um, next slide, please. So um, the session that we are going to do on Monday, <laughs> um, we're, we've been calling critical sorting. So essentially, it's going to start with a little presentation by me about what libraries are and the systems that we use. Um, I think there are a lot of assumptions about libraries and we all know the phrase libraries are not neutral, um, but most students do not. And so it's really an opportunity for us to talk about um, things like Library of Congress, the biases that exist within subject headings. Um, I get to do a little shout out to critical cataloging, um, but really getting them to think about, uh, you know, that everything is organized and how do we think critically about the systems that organize that. Um, I also give them some other ways of knowing. Um, I did a, a part of this presentation at the Oxbow School. Uh, it's like an artist residency in Michigan. Um, I collaborated with a data visualization class and we talked about, um, we kind of generated some like alternative organizational strategies, some of which were really interesting um, and very like, physical and others that were a little bit more um, wild. So like, for instance, uh, essentially every um, person chose like a collection and it could be anything of things on Oxbow's campus. And then they were asked to reorganize that collection by a set of their own roles. So for instance, there's like an old VHS collection that they have there. Cause think like camp, it's like a camp. Um, and so somebody rearranged all the VHSs according to like alphabetically, but by the second letter in the title, or we had um, somebody chose there's like a collection of life, life raft or um, life preservers, because it's like on a lake. Um, and so they organize them by uh, like the most new to the like most used things like that. Um, so there were some interesting conversations that came out of that in terms of like, what we value and privilege, but also like how unexpected things can happen when you change up the organization. Um, and then, uh, then I'm going to kind of talk about the activity that we're going to have students do where we're essentially turning them into the algorithm and asking them to write an, write an algorithm that then they are going to apply to a very specific portion of our library. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is kind of how the activity is going to go. We're going to have Students in small groups brainstorm 10 alternative organizational models, um, select one and then name it. So I'm also gonna include, I kind of want people to do um, some pretty, I mean, people here are fairly spe speculative and we do a lot um, in terms of that and like holistically at the library. 
So I have a couple of ideas. I don't want to give too many things away because I want to see what they come up with on their own. But one I am going to suggest is I really want somebody to do like organizing a number of titles based on like the Zodiac or uh, like based on publication date. Um, I think that would be really interesting. <laughs> so like all the Scorpio books together or all the like Gemini books together, whatever. Um, but the idea is that they're going to come up with 10 ideas. They're going to pick one. Then I'm going to have them describe in detail the process of reorganizing and then searching the materials um, according to the new algorithm. And so uh, in a very like literal way, step-by-step -step process. Um, and then they're going to give that algorithm and they're going to swap it with another group. So after they've written it, they're giving it to essentially test on another um, group of students. Um, they're going to follow the directions. Then they're going to, and the new group is going to take uh, notes, describe the process, what worked, what didn't, what felt confusing, um, especially because later in class, they're going to use the same algorithm and apply it to a different data set. Um, but once they've done that, everyone's going to kind of have this collection from the new algorithm, um, and they're going to make a collaborative piece of art from uh, what's whatever is inside. We chose the uh, oversized books in our collection because those tend to be the most like beautifully uh, represented, lots of like big images and photos and all that. Um, and then we're gonna have a little debrief. So what unexpected results did you get using this approach? Um, and really like what connections did you make that would have otherwise been hidden? I think a lot of what I try to um, hit home to students is like most of art school is about for forcing connections where there don't seem to be obvious ones. Um, and I think that this idea of like talking about how algorithms can restrict that and any system really, including the way the library is organized can really limit that. And so in uh, until you're able to kind of like rethink or have some divergent thinking about organizational strategies in general. Um, like when you are able to do that, you're maybe able to see things in a different way and make connections where you might not have already done that. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just some of the learning outcomes that we're hoping for um, based on the ACRL framework. Um, searching a strategic exploration, I feel like is an easy one for art school, um, but then research is inquiry and authority is constructed and contextual are the other ones that we're hoping to drive home within this. And I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so now we're ready for a Q&A. Thank you all so much. Um, amazing for a second time. I really appreciate you doing that. So we have a little over five minutes left, and I would like to invite anybody who has questions. You can feel free to unmute and ask, but you can also put it in the chat and we will do our best to get to it. So any questions? My concern as a librarian is how to communicate to students the mm, the false the false understanding they have of what AI generated content is and where it comes from. And are you finding students reception uh, receptive to the to the distinctions you're making? Because when it comes from a computer, it's like it's just given all this credibility, right? It's like it's it's real and it's it's authoritative. Like it it's it's like you have to overcome their expectation that it's valid. It, 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 that's my concern. Sure. Um, I I think from a sort of media literacy standpoint, um, there is sort of a lot of critical visual literacy that um can uh come into the conversation. But from a generative art standpoint, these students are already thinking about how images are created because they themselves create them. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're not looking at images as objective truth. They're looking at them as um, products of, uh, you know, human um, uh, sort of synthesis and interpretation of, you know, the world. And so I think um, that creates a, re a really helpful context for them to think about how computers do that um, or how um, uh, algorithms do that as uh, things that have been created by people. Um, and so uh, I think that um, if you think of it uh, in terms of media literacy, there's already a lot of good um, sort of stuff out there um, that deals with things like deep fake um, videos, et cetera. Um, 
I think being able to distinguish between um, generated images and I don't know what we'll call like nat natural images. I'm not sure what kind of terminology we'll adapt there. Um, uh, we're already seeing sort of the like, oh, well, you know, it's AI because, you know, the person has six fingers or whatever. But I just also want to caution people that like some people do have six fingers, you know, like some people um, like their bodies are not um, don't fit into a normative box. And so I also hate that sort of strategy where we are like it can't be real if it doesn't conform to our idea of what a human body looks like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I also want to put some kind of caution in into those conversations as well. Um, we talked about the ACRL framework for visual or information literacy, but um, there is also an ACRL framework work for visual literacy. Um, and we have, because um, uh, I am one of the contributors to that document, uh, we put a lot of thought into the sort of critical looking um, and media literacy aspect of images. And so um, uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at that, um, it is on the ACRL website. And Stephanie Grimm just dropped that in the chat. Um, okay. And I'll let my uh, co-panelists reflect on this. Yeah, I just wanted to also say there's a couple of questions in that chat that I think would be useful to talk about. So um, Adele, you had asked like what kind of setting these conversations are having, so or like if it's during an info lit session or a dedicated session on this topic. So for myself, it's kind of a mix of both. So it's not quite a one shot because students in theory have already come in the previous semester, um, but it is not without some of that. Um, and I think my assumption from my colleagues that the, is that those would be kind of standalone sessions, but I don't want to speak for them. Yes. Yeah, I'm definitely thinking about this as either standing on its own or building into existing assignments or activities just based on what I'm seeing coming out of our department. Um, what I'm learning is not, uh, so I was expecting going into this that more of our faculty would actually be really deep in these discussions and it doesn't seem to be happening at the school level yet there are some individuals who are doing that um but what we're also noticing is that there's not really institutional like discussions happening of this that are actually involving interdisciplinary conversations like um we are launching mason's launching a new cloud computing school and there was a uh, a symposium a couple like a month or two ago on ai and machine learning and there were no librarians involved in that, nobody from the School of Art. It was all like the engineering and then some interdisciplinary in like very generous terms, uh, folks involved in that conversation. But that's, you know, I'm like, where are we actually overlapping in this? Um, there was a great paper given during ACRL on machine learning um, from someone who's a data management librarian. Um, I'll see if I can find the, the link because I know ACRL just published the proceedings. Um, so she was really coming from a perspective of working more with um, engineers and software developers, but thinking about how machine learning is already embedded in our databases and library systems and how that's starting to shape and present this idea of like what disciplines are. Um, so I don't know if that answers the original question. It was something that came up during ACRL as well. Uh, but for me, like I said too, this isn't hasn't actually happened yet. I found one faculty member who is um, building AI into an illustration assignment. So, and we had had a great conversation, but the timing didn't work out for me to actually do something with the classroom. So I'm hoping in the next iteration of her picture book course that we can actually work on something like this. Um, and then just, uh, what was the, I'm trying to find the question. Um, so who, who voiced the question earlier? Um, I've been thinking a lot about too how our own beliefs or discussions around photography kind of are crossing over into AI. So like this this persistent belief in photography is like a veristic or objective format. We kind of now see crossing into um, uh, issues with AI and machine learning. And, and I say we very generally, like obviously in the arts, we talk about photography is not an objective medium, but that belief of being presented with something real. And so now that's sort of coming back to bite us as we're seeing things being generated that are very clearly um, generated. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, with that, we've hit noon. So we've ended our official time. Um, I'm hoping that the questions people asked in the chat were answered with our uh, 
very brief but really thoughtful discussion just now. But I would also like to remind folks that this will um, recording will be shared after this session. So once I've got things cleaned up, look out for the link for that, just in case there was anything you wanted to review from what was discussed today. And also, I'm sure our panelists will welcome any questions. If folks um, can I can I say speak on your behalf? If folks want to follow up and ask you um, um, things just by email or whatever. Um, hopefully the conversation will continue. So thanks again um, to all my colleagues, Mackenzie, Stephanie Mimosa, and Maggie for sharing again. And um, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out. Right. Thanks, Carla May. This was really fun to do again. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for organizing this. Thank you, Carla May. You're so welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>